Once again, I think it's safe to say this wasn't what anyone was expecting or probably hoping for. Extreme middle chapter woes beware here, but also some head scratching decision making, which is a bit on par for the course at this point. With the exception of the final cliffhanger of part one, it worked mostly as a standalone film, but this does not, and the perception of it could greatly change if part three sticks the landing. For now, I'm pretty torn. Spoilers from here on out. The biggest issue with Crisis Part 2 is that it takes absolutely forever to continue the story. We get a pretty decent opening with Batman and Joker and Fam, including a sideline Batman Beyond, seriously, by the end he has like three lines, and then it devolves into flashbacks for the next act and a half. While these flashbacks are key to character moments and decisions by the end, and are formatted in such a way as the comic and like reading it, I don't think the non-linear nature of it does the film any favors. It's sometimes artful and philosophical, but it also feels a bit pretentious and extremely disjointed instead of profound. I complained in part one that the entire backstory on the Justice League coming together felt like this, but that was made up for by experiencing time as Flash was, with a deeply stirring and impactful conclusion. None of that's here. Instead, it feels like padding because these scenes didn't fit in part one, so they put them in part two. But the connective threads aren't as strong and the editing does the film absolutely no favors in this regard as well. It can be difficult to discern where we are in the timeline and what version of who we're looking at. I'm still iffy on that animation style. I greatly appreciate the ambition on display. The extended backstory on Psycho Pirate really adds to his decisions throughout. Although I think this should have been in the first film, and end with the reveal of the Anti-Monitor, then have part two open with the death of the Legion, and then flashback to how Supergirl was found by the Monitor. The ideas are here, but the entire thing needs to be reshuffled to flow more logically and consistently. And once we're past all the exposition of flashbacks, which get uncomfortably dark at times, we get into the meat of the conflict. And it's all essentially a big build up to finding out that the wave isn't a natural disaster but a sentient attack. So I get holding back the anti-monitor, but the dramatic irony could have strengthened the proceedings since Psycho Pirate knew. The shadow demons are kind of lame and feel strangely too similar to the CW adaptation, while the other people turning on each other provides for some good action and weight to the power of Psycho Pirate. But it also does nothing for me by the end because they kind of randomly snap out of it without any reasoning as to why or the build up. I do love Jon Stewart's big moment and how he inadvertently brings the, back the John Constantine from the DC AMU, following up on the House of Mystery and Apocalypse War. It's exciting stuff. And everything with the Bat family is pretty entertaining when it hit me. But as Flash was the focus of the first one, this one is a little bit too distracted and spread thinly. You have a huge portion for Supergirl, a huge portion for Psycho Pirate, which if that had been in the first, it could have fixed the villain problem and then teases for the Bat family. And I'm wondering if they should have just been the focus, Batman and his kids, or maybe three parts isn't enough. Maybe this should have been a 13 episode limited series as then the structural issues wouldn't matter hardly at all. It all ends up feeling like a gigantic setup for a payoff in the third film. And ultimately it doesn't even end, it just stops. That cliffhanger ending is just annoyingly abrupt leaving everything to the third and me wondering if three will be more conventional. But knowing Kevin Conway and Mark Hamill come back, plus everything they've done to tie stuff up has me nervous. I do love how there were direct references, scenes, and callbacks to various DC shorts over the years, especially the ones from the Tomorrowverse, such as Kamandi. It's very vindicating to be rewarded for watching so much, but I feel like anyone who hasn't done that homework and seen those is missing a lot of context. And side note, the Arrowverse is even referenced here as Psycho Pirate claims he was one of these characters in The Flash, which is a separate multiverse with its own crisis. So can he change multiverses in the Omniverse? It's probably better I don't ask, but the reference was appreciated, I think. For what I'm giving this now, it could be bumped up a half star or even down depending on how the future of part three plays out. I always allow some wiggle room in my ratings, but ultimately this film has exciting moments. Some truly great character development and unfortunately it feels disjointed, confused, and spends its screen time unfocused where it's felt a lot of this could have been covered already. And when it gets going, it gets better. But I'm going to need more from my boy Terry McGinnis. He largely feels wasted as of now. Whereas part one made questionable calls with structure, its ending mostly justified it with an emotional send off for a beloved character whose powers made the experimental narrative logistical. This doesn't get to use that. Part two's individual pieces are compelling but don't come together as a whole yet. It's still completely riding a part three which could land the plane well. However, I can completely get why anyone would be disappointed in these so far and really wouldn't want to check out anymore. I'm actually kind of wondering if this could provide a fun re-editing project for me in the future. I give Justice League Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 2, 2.5 out of 5 stars. Thanks so much for watching. Give the movie a chance to see what you think. And remember, always look for the good.